Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at three disturbing cases with you. The first case we'll be looking at is the tragic case of Lily James. Murder of Sydney water polo coach Lily James. The family of Lily James, the young teacher, murdered. After a young woman was killed inside one of the city's most prestigious schools. Australia was left in disbelief and sadness when the news hit about Lily James. The details were so heart-wrenching as she was found lifeless in the school bathroom with a severe head injury, so bad that the police mentioned she was almost unrecognisable. Serious head injuries, uh, and the actual scene itself was quite confronting for the other. Uh, Today, let's delve into the layers of this deeply saddening story, Lily James, her unfortunate passing, and the widespread sorrow that now covers not just her local community, but the entire nation. This leaves everyone grappling with more questions than answers. To begin with, Lily James came into the world in May 2002, born to Jamie and Peter James. Her family shared that she spent her youth growing up in Sans Souci, New South Wales. In 2020, she marked a milestone by graduating from Dane Bank in Hurstville. The following year, she took on sports business at the University of Technology, Sydney. Lily's mom used to share every moment of her life on social media. While juggling her studies, Lily was determined to make a mark as a part-time water polo coach at St. Andrew's Cathedral School. During this time, she crossed paths with Paul Tyson, a sports coach and former student at the same school. Their working relationship evolved into something more, and they began dating. On the other side, Paul Thyssen is a 24-year-old sports coach at St. Andrew's Cathedral School in Sydney, Australia, and he was once a student there until 2017. Originally from the Netherlands, he came to Australia in 2015 to pursue a master's in teaching and fulfill his dream of becoming a PE teacher. He was also recognized as a hockey coach at St. Vincent's College in Potts Point. Now the details about Lily and Paul's relationship are somewhat unclear but a lot of students have stepped forward to provide some insights into Paul's behavior. Former students revealed to the Saturday Telegraph that the ex-sports assistant used to brag about his relationship with Miss James and engaged in behaviors that made them uneasy. In an exclusive interview with the paper, students labeled Thyssen as a creep who flirted with girls at the school, describing him as having a roving eye and an unsettling, flirtatious personality. One student shared, he made young girls in the sports team uncomfortable with his wandering eye and flirtatious nature. I'm shocked, but there's no denying he was a creep. Additionally, former peers from his school days labeled him arrogant, stating he was disliked by boys, but had popularity among girls. Now on the evening of October 25th, 2023, around 7 p.m., Lily was seen entering the school's gym bathroom, with Paul closely following, as caught on CCTV. Given their recent breakup, it's assumed that a heated argument unfolded in that very restroom. About an hour later, Thiessen was spotted on his own, coming out of the bathroom. What makes this whole situation intriguing is that Paul sent a text to Lily's dad, using Lily's own phone, asking him to pick her up. But it was thought that Lily's dad ignored the message because she had her car at school, so he might have thought it was just a mistake. Afterward, Paul drove the borrowed white Lexus to Diamond Bay Reserve in Vaucluse, along Sydney's east coast. CCTV footage captured him disposing of a hammer in a bin, which was later confirmed to be the main weapon at the scene. Strangely, he didn't waste time reporting a lifeless body at St. Andrews to the police, but he did this two hours after leaving the scene. According to Dr. Watson Monroe, Paul spent several hours at that location, using the time to cause more trouble thinking he still had control over the situation. Once he was done at the reserve, Paul pondered his future, considering the likely prison sentence for his terrible actions and his overall future in Australia. It's worth noting that he was not an Australian citizen. His third successive working holiday visa was about to expire. So it's likely that he was feeling scared at this moment, wondering what was going to happen to him. He contacted the police four hours after Miss James was killed in the gym bathroom reaching out to them around midnight from Vaucluse Reserve. The operator relayed the information saying, the informant says there's a body in a bathroom on the right-hand side in the reception area, through reception and to the left. The informant mentions being there a couple of hours ago, a female body. 
The police didn't waste time finding Lily James, and it was confirmed that she was fatally beaten with a hammer. They said she had serious head injuries, and the surgeries she had were described as disturbing and shocking to see. Before the police could locate Paul, he fell from the cliffs above Diamond Bay to his death. The morning after Miss James's death became known, the New South Wales Police Air Wing searched the sea from above, while emergency services scoured the rocks below. Police towed away a white Lexus from the scene, stating that Paul Tyson was still wanted for questioning regarding Miss James's death. However, they didn't find Paul that day. On Friday, October 27th, a group of tradesmen working on the Diamond Bay walkway noticed a white object slumped across rocks below. For hours, police in a boat and on a jet ski worked to retrieve the swollen and battered body from the base of the cliffs before bringing it up to the road in the afternoon. It was confirmed that it was indeed Paul. In a peculiar twist, Paul seemed to manipulate the final stages of his sinister plan. He had called the police, possibly hoping Lily would be found sooner. Dr. Xanthi Mallet, a criminologist, suggested on Channel 7's Sunrise program that this manipulation was another attempt at control before Paul chose to end his own life. Doctor. The only reason I can really think of that he would have sent that message is to uh, get the father to attend at that school. So in essence, either he hoped the father would find Lily or hoped that he would be there. Dr. Mallet explained, he showed signs that he wanted Lily to be found. That may indicate he was hoping someone would find her and call an ambulance, for example. Alternatively, he may have been wanting to potentially change the time at which the police thought she had died by sending those proof-of-life messages to her father and then later calling the police. According to the police, the hammer purchased by Paul Tyson was not the one used to kill Miss James. Police believe Tyson had two hammers, with the second possibly originating from a school storeroom. Esther and Steph Thiessen, the parents of Paul Tyson, have decided not to bring his remains back to the Netherlands. Instead, they've chosen to have him cremated, and his ashes will be scattered in Australia. With Paul no longer alive, there are many unanswered questions about the reasons behind his actions and the dynamics of their relationship. However, one thing remains evident, Lily was cherished by the entire community. During the funeral, loved ones brought dozens of lilies to honor Lily, making the day all about her, as described by her father, Jamie James, in a brief statement. He spoke of Lily as an independent and vibrant young woman who lived each day to the fullest. Despite her busy schedule with work and studies, Lily found time to support her brother Max, her friends, and her family. Jamie expressed gratitude for the community's thoughts, prayers, generosity, and messages during this difficult time thanking them for the many cherished memories shared with Lily. Friends, family, and students gathered for the service wearing brightly colored outfits. Hugs and tears were exchanged as mourners entered the school. Dozens of school children in uniform from all year groups at St. Andrew S. came by bus to pay their respects. Approximately 500 staff, students, and alumni attended the service, prompting the closure of the school for the day. The choice to hold the service at Dane Bank Anglican School for Girls was likely due to Lily's status as an alumna. The atmosphere got very quiet as they rolled Lily's casket out of the school gates. Lily's dad, Jamie, and her brother Max were right there, helping guide her to the waiting white hearse. You could see the sadness on their faces as they put Lily's coffin in the car. Tears were flowing, and folks around were saying kind words to comfort each other. Lily's coffin was decked out with lots of colorful flowers, like a nod to her lively self. The funeral crew took their time fixing up the wreaths that friends and family brought. Each bunch of flowers told a story, a memory of the love everyone felt for Lily. When the hearse finally drove off, folks stood there, saying their last goodbyes. There was a moment of quiet, and then everyone headed inside the school gates for the wake. Inside, stories about Lily were shared and everyone took a minute to remember and celebrate the awesome life of Lily James. It was a mix of feeling sad, but also nostalgically remembering the good times she brought to everyone around her. She was something special. Her kindness, her loyalty to people, and just the gentlest person. In conclusion, the manhunt for Lily's killer might close in its search, but for her family, the deep sadness in their hearts is something that won't ever fade away. 
The next case we will be looking at is the twisted case of Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Dad, I'm on a high right now. I'm living my best life and y'all can't take that from me. And the D is... Fire! Gaining a lot of limelight on social media, this is Gypsy Rose Blanchard, recently released from prison on December 28, 2023. With multiple documentaries and a TV series made about her, Gypsy has become the face of one of the most disturbing true crime cases in the history of the U.S. But who is she really? Why did she go to prison? Did she deserve to go to prison? Looking at her now, you'd hardly recognize the sick little girl she once was, or the sick little girl she was forced to be. Born July 27, 1991, Gypsy Rose Blanchard was born as a beautiful, healthy baby. But as she grew up, her adolescence became riddled with various illnesses. According to Rod Blanchard, when Gypsy was just a baby, Dee Dee told him that she was suffering from sleep apnea and needed a heart monitor. Dee Dee told me that she started having seizures and sleep apnea. As Gypsy grew older and older, so did the list of her illnesses. Around the age of five, Gypsy got muscular dystrophy and had to use a wheelchair to get around. Later on, she also got a feeding tube Soon after she got hearing and vision impairment, leukemia, epilepsy, along with mental retardation. Dee Dee told everyone that Gypsy had the mind of a child. This helped Dee Dee and Gypsy garner the heartfelt sympathies of their local community. They would receive funding for medical support, trips to Disneyland, and conferences all over the country. They had achieved somewhat of a celebrity status and would get financial support from multiple charities and fundraisers. Gypsy even rubbed shoulders with many A-list celebrities. It was as if everyone's heart broke seeing a little girl ridden with so many diseases. But this didn't affect her spirit at all. In every photo she's seen to be smiling, displaying her happy-go-lucky nature, despite the mountain of medical ailments she had to deal with on a daily basis. Little did everyone know that this smile was just a facade behind which a helpless girl was trapped, waiting to be freed. That's right. Dee Dee tried her best to keep presenting Gypsy as a frail little girl, dressing her up in princess dresses. But Gypsy desperately wanted to break free from that mold. One thing that Gypsy knew for a fact was that she could walk without a wheelchair and did not need a feeding tube. As a child, she would ask her mother multiple times why she had to use the wheelchair when she could walk. But her mom told her that her muscles weren't strong enough and forced her to use the wheelchair. To keep up this facade, Dee Dee would force her daughter to stay still and not move her legs while Mommy Dearest did all the talking with the doctors. Hurricane Katrina destroyed their home in 2005. With the help of Habitat for Humanity and the support of public donations, they were given a new home in Springfield, Missouri. The mother and daughter were both overjoyed to get their new home. It had been specially designed for someone with disabilities. A ramp was made so that the entrance could be accessed by someone on a wheelchair. Even the doors inside were wide enough just for Gypsy's wheelchair. Dee Dee had successfully fooled the medical system, taking advantage of the kindness of friends and neighbors. Her carefully designed web of lies was truly a masterclass in deception. Of course, it was years before we found out that, you know, she didn't have leukemia. That wasn't true. That all of it was a lie. But the question is, why would Dee Dee force her daughter to go through such needlessly painful surgeries and medication? We do know that Dee Dee was suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a psychological disorder where a caregiver exaggerates or manipulates the illness of another person in order to gain unnecessary medical attention. But what would cause Dee Dee to abuse her daughter in such a manner? And how did she manage to get away with it for more than two decades? If we take a look at the dynamics of the Peter family and the environment Dee Dee grew up in, it would be easier to understand why she grew up to be an abusive mother. Dee Dee was born on May 3, 1967, in Golden Meadow, Louisiana. Her parents were Emma Lois Gisclair and Claude Anthony Peter. She was the youngest of six children and, according to her siblings, was heavily favored by their mother. She had three older brothers and two older sisters. According to her brother Evans Peter, it seemed as if Dee Dee craved attention ever since she was young. She wanted to be in the limelight and tried hard to be different from others. Growing up, Dee Dee herself was a sick child. 
According to her siblings, Dee Dee had various illnesses like heart murmur when she was just a baby. It's interesting to note that Dee Dee recreated the same childhood with Gypsy as the one her mother gave her. Dee Dee's mother, Emma would often pamper her and was very overprotective of her. She would let the other kids play outside but not Dee Dee. She wasn't allowed to be like other kids. She couldn't play outside, exert herself, or wear herself out. Much to the annoyance of her siblings, Dee Dee was treated like a princess and didn't even have to partake in the household chores. Dee Dee could use her sickness as an excuse whenever she wanted. Her siblings could easily observe that their sister wasn't as sick as their mother wanted her to be. It seemed as if Emma did not want her youngest child to grow up. She would coddle, smother her, and treat her like a baby. While the rest of the siblings slept in their own rooms, young Dee Dee slept next to her mother. They were way more close than a normal mother-daughter should be. As Dee Dee grew older, she continued to enjoy her status as the favorite child. She was the only one out of the six siblings who went to college and even got a car. While Dee Dee got what she asked for, her siblings had to work hard for these privileges. As mentioned earlier, Dee Dee loved getting attention so she signed up for different beauty pageants. This wish, like many others, was also fulfilled by her parents who showered her with dresses and accessories. For some time, she had also worked as a nurse's aide. This helped her gain a sound knowledge of faking illnesses and symptoms, making her the perfect candidate for Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen by proxy perpetrators go to the ends of the earth to maintain the charade of having a sick child. Other than forcing Gypsy to act sick, Dee Dee was also an accomplished fraudster. She had successfully scammed people out of their money by starting fundraisers and charities in Gypsy's name. She even changed Gypsy's birth certificate from 1991 to 1995. This was done in order to present Gypsy as an infantilized little girl, heavily dependent on her mother. But this wasn't the first time Dee Dee had gotten in trouble with the law. According to her sister, Dee Dee was a frequent shoplifter wrote fake checks, and stole a lot of money from people. And run up the bills like crazy. She was going to do anything, any way, anyhow to get her way. All of this combined really altered my view of Dee Dee. Her siblings also stated that when Emma, their mother, got sick, it was Dee Dee who took care of her. Her sister relays how Dee Dee would starve their mother and was an accomplice in her death. Their stepmother, Laura, also accused Dee Dee of trying to poison her. Her family hated her so much that they didn't even want her ashes and flushed them down the toilet. Rod met Dee Dee at a bowling alley when he was just 17. He seemed quite taken with the curly-haired girl who looked a little different from the usual crowd. At that time, Dee Dee had been hiding her age. They met up again and soon after began officially dating. After some time, Dee Dee got pregnant. Rod, being the honorable person, proposed to her immediately. So at the young age of 17, Rod Blanchard got married to 24-year-old Claudine Peter. At first, Claudine proved to be the typical perfect Southern wife and was a generous partner. But the marriage didn't work out as Rod felt that they got married for the wrong reasons. He woke up on his 18th birthday, realizing that he had made the wrong decision. So after just three months of marriage, the two parted ways forever. According to him, Dee Dee was into dark stuff like witchcraft and even had a pet tarantula. After Gypsy's birth, Dee Dee became a very overprotective mother. She wouldn't let anyone else babysit her. Even Rod, her own father, was never left alone with his daughter. Dee Dee just had to supervise her at all times. On the outside, everyone thought that Dee Dee was a kind and caring mother. So Rod thought that even though it didn't work out between them, Dee Dee was still the best mother anyone could ask for. Dee Dee started taking care of Gypsy 24-7. She would inform Rod about fake medical ailments, tests, and medication that their daughter needed. Rod, being the dutiful father, consistently paid her child support and alimony. He took great responsibility for his daughter's medical expenses. When Rod started asking more questions about Gypsy's illness, Dee Dee decided to move to Thibodeau, which is quite far away. It's important to note that this was probably part of Dee Dee's plan. The only way she could hide her lies was if she isolated Gypsy from anyone who could get suspicious. 
So Dee Dee kept putting more distance between Gypsy and her father and moved farther and farther away. It seemed very clear that Dee Dee did not want their relationship to deepen. She wanted to be the sole caregiver of her daughter. As Gypsy grew older, her mother began planting terrible things in Gypsy's mind to turn her against Rod. When the duo relocated to Missouri after Hurricane Katrina, it became even harder for Rod to keep up a good relationship with Gypsy. Rod feared that if he raised any serious concerns, Dee Dee might sever all connections with him. However, Rod now regrets not being more present in his daughter's life. He feels as if he failed to protect Gypsy, but he's not the only one who feels this way. Dee Dee brought Gypsy to the pediatric neurologist in August 2007. This was Dr. Bernardo Flasterstein. By this time, of course, the best excuse Dee Dee gave for not having Gypsy's medical records was the fact that the hurricane had happened. Dee Dee said that her daughter's medical records had gotten lost during the chaos of relocating to Missouri. Dr. Bernardo noted that the mother was answering all the questions while Gypsy remained silent. Dee Dee began detailing the list of her daughter's illnesses which Dr. Bernardo had no choice but to trust. However, one thing that the doctor noticed was that the volume of Gypsy's muscles as well as her reflexes were quite normal. Of the spine to see if there could be anything that I'm missing. And it was completely normal. The MRI came out completely normal. Dr. Bernardo couldn't find a single reason why Gypsy couldn't just get up and walk. But Dee Dee remained adamant that Gypsy could not walk. It seems she realized there was nothing she could do to prove the supposed muscular dystrophy. So Dee Dee never went back to Dr. Flasterstein again. This made him suspicious of Dee Dee's intentions. So my duty was to tell the pediatrician in my report. The pediatric neurologist who raised the notion of Munchausen by proxy had... Dr. Bernard claims that he needed more information in order to report DD to Child Protective Services. But like many others, he did not take a stand, hence failing to protect Gypsy. As Gypsy started growing older, she craved more independence. She felt as if she was being suffocated by DD. Gypsy narrates that she would ask her mother if they could try removing the feeding tube or getting some physical therapy for her legs, but Dee Dee outright refused. One day Gypsy found a medical card which stated her birth year as 1991 instead of 1994. So at that time, Gypsy was 19 instead of 15. This meant that Gypsy was a legal adult who could go about as she wished, something Dee Dee didn't want. Gypsy hatched a plan to escape she met an older guy at a sci-fi convention, a 36-year-old guy who she thought could help her get away from Dee Dee, so she ran away with him. But this escape was sadly short-lived as her mother soon found her and brought her back home. Dee Dee was furious. After learning that Gypsy had run away with a friend, her computer was smashed and she was chained to her bed. Dee Dee even went as far as covering up the bedroom windows so no one could see inside. Her actions gave a whole new meaning to the word house arrest. Poor Gypsy would only be unchained when she had to go to the bathroom. For about two weeks, Gypsy sustained her mother's cruelty. She was verbally abused, beaten, and starved. All Gypsy wanted was to live a normal life like any other girl, but she knew that as long as her mother was alive, that dream could never turn into reality. A few years later, Gypsy made a profile on the dating website, christiandating.com. It was here where she met her soon-to-be boyfriend, Nicholas Gadajan in October of 2012. Gypsy was desperate for an escape from life, and she found one, online in Nicholas. She felt as if he was the only one who accepted her, despite her flaws. She felt that she could be herself as Nick accepted her, when Gypsy told him that she was in a wheelchair. Soon the two started liking each other, and their relationship deepened. Unbeknownst to Gypsy, Gadijan, who lived in Waukesha, Wisconsin, had a history of mental illness. He also had a criminal record of indecent exposure in a public place and disorderly conduct. As their relationship progressed, Gadajan started sharing more things about himself. He told Gypsy that he had multiple personality disorder and was a vampire. Gypsy, on the other hand, was so desperate for attention that she did whatever he wanted in order to please him. She even made up different personalities of her own to match Gadajan's. The pair continued exchanging messages and talked about sex 
relationships, and marriage. As the relationship progressed, things took a darker turn as the pair started getting involved in BDSM. Gypsy was warned by Gadajan's ex-girlfriend to be wary of Nick, but Gypsy paid no attention. Nick and Gypsy hatched a plan to meet at a movie theater. Gypsy was going with Dee Dee to see the live-action Cinderella. She decided that a random run-in at the movie theater would be a good time to introduce her mom to Nicholas. The pair thought that if they could carefully orchestrate this meeting, maybe Dee Dee would take a liking to Gadajan. So on March 12, 2015, Gypsy bought the ticket for him, and the two went on with their plan as decided. During the movie, Gypsy excused herself to go to the bathroom, where she and Gadajan had sex. But not everything went according to plan. When Dee Dee saw that Gypsy was missing, she went to the bathroom and saw Gypsy coming out just in the nick of time. They both had an argument, during which Dee Dee slapped Gypsy. Dee Dee didn't like Gadajan at all. She thought that it was weird and creepy for a grown man to watch a kid's movie by himself. Once again, Gypsy's dreams were shattered. The two of them hatched another plan. A plan to be together forever, but for that they'd have to remove the only person who stood in their way. In June, Gypsy bought a bus ticket for Gadajan to come to Springfield. They had previously discussed purchasing duct tape and knives and how they would plan on killing Dee Dee. Gypsy even made a video of the house for Nick to make sure that he was familiar with the layout. On June 9th, the day of the murder, Gypsy and her mom had gone to the grocery store. Upon coming back, they shared a heartfelt mother-daughter moment and painted each other's nails. They had fought earlier and had just made up. Dee Dee said she felt relaxed as she drifted off to sleep. Gypsy stated that she promised to be a good girl. The last words Dee Dee said to Gypsy were, Don't hurt me which is sadly ironic, as the opposite was going to happen very soon. When Nicholas arrived at their residence, Gypsy had already placed gloves for him outside. She gave him a knife and duct tape. Then she hid in her bathroom and covered her ears sitting in a fetal position. Then she heard her mother wake up and call out for help. I heard her say my name a couple times. And, um, and she said, help me. And then there was just silence. Did she scream? Yeah. But Gypsy covered her ears, pretending to not hear her blood-curdling screams, her mother calling out her name, begging for help. Nick stabbed Dee Dee a total of 17 times. Gypsy later states that it was a horrible experience listening to the screams. She said she wanted it to stop, but was simply too afraid to go out and help her. After some time, the scream stopped, and that's when Nick came into the bathroom, holding the bloody knife. Gypsy cleaned up the drops of blood that had fallen in the hallway. They also stole a sizable chunk of money from Dee Dee's room. After this, he and Gypsy had sex while Dee Dee's body lay in the bedroom next door. According to Gadajan, the sex was consensual, but Gypsy says it wasn't. Afterwards, the duo packed their stuff and went to the motel Gadajan was staying at. Mm. Hi, honey. I'm <laughs> feeling <laughs> it. From the motel, they mailed the murder weapon to Nick's home in Wisconsin. Gadajan's parents had no clue about the contents of the mysterious package that arrived at their doorstep. After staying at the hotel for a few days, they went to stay with Nick's mom and stepfather. By now it had been a few days since anyone had seen Dee Dee or Gypsy. Their friends and neighbors had gotten a bit worried. Gypsy stated that she wanted her mom's body to be found so that the authorities could give her a proper burial. That's when she logged into the Facebook account that both she and her mother shared, and posted a series of messages that would raise concerns for the family's well-being. Friends of the family were quite disturbed when they read the violently disturbing nature of these Facebook messages. The scenario where she was raped is just perverse. 
It implies a fair degree of sociopathy. Just the, the way the girl acted. Dee Dee and Gypsy were not the sort to play jokes or pranks, and since nobody had heard from them in a while, their friends reported this incident to the police. The police decided to do a welfare check. Dave Blanchard, a close friend of the family, was the first person who entered the house through a window. He looked around, but saw no sign of the mother and daughter. At this time, Dee Dee's body was inside the house, but Dave did not see it. Seeing that the house was seemingly untouched, and all three of Gypsy's wheelchairs were still inside the house, he reported back to the police. The police thought that both mother and daughter were missing, but on June 14th they found Dee Dee's slain body inside the house, which Dave had missed, perhaps thankfully. The police traced the IP address of the Facebook post to Gottajohn's mother's home in Wisconsin. One morning the Bonnie and Clyde duo woke up to the sound of police, they were taken into custody by June 15, 2015. The couple consoled each other and decided to stick together. However, upon interrogation, they gave opposing statements. Gypsy appears to act shocked upon hearing her mother is dead, even though she was an accomplice through and through. On the other hand, Gadajan shifts the entire blame of the murder on Gypsy. Friends of the famous mother and daughter were shocked to learn about the details that unfolded during the trial. The intricate web of lies, manipulation, and financial fraud that was uncovered captivated the whole nation. To escape the possibility of life in prison, Gypsy agreed to plead guilty to second-degree murder in July of 2016. She got 10 years with the possibility of early parole. The defense also took into account the medical trauma, psychological, and physical abuse that Gypsy endured for more than two decades. But people still questioned the violent extent of Gypsy's actions. Her boyfriend, on the other hand, got life in prison for his crimes. Gypsy details that her days in prison were some of the happiest days of her life. For once in her life, she felt truly free. The best memory that I have in my entire life is the day that I got to prison and I got to go out to the picnic tables. And I'm like, I'm free. I'm free to have friends. I'm free to do what I want. I might be in a controlled environment, but this is nice. <laughs> she also started taking part in girly activities like learning how to do her hair and makeup. It seems as if she finally got the freedom she craved for so long. During prison, many men wrote to Gypsy, but there was only one that stood out to her in particular. To the surprise of Ryan Anderson, Gypsy sent him an email back. Ryan is a middle school special education teacher. The two began writing to each other regularly and soon developed an intimate relationship. They got married in August of 2022. Gypsy got free on December 28, 2023. She said that one of the first things on her list was to consummate her marriage with Anderson. After that, Gypsy spent some time with her dad, stepmother Christy, and half-siblings. It seemed as if Gypsy finally got the happy ending she craved all her life. But to this day, Gypsy still regrets her actions. She says that she didn't want to kill her mother. She just wanted to be free and have a normal life. She says that her relationship with her mother was complicated. But it doesn't change the fact that she loved her and still misses her. But regardless of all of that, I still love her and I still miss her she was my mother. The next case we will be looking at is the shocking case of Sarah Everard. In the dimly lit streets of London, a chilling mystery unfolds, captivating the attention of a nation. Sarah Everard, a vibrant 33-year-old woman, vanishes into the night, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a community gripped by fear and confusion. This is the story of Sarah's disappearance, the investigation that followed, and the shocking truths that would be uncovered. In the days leading up to her disappearance, Sarah Everard, a 33-year-old marketing executive, was living a seemingly ordinary life in London. Little did she know, her routine walk home from a friend's house on the evening of March 3, 2021, would take a dark turn. Sarah was last seen on CCTV footage at around 9.30 p.m., walking alone along Clapham Common Southside, a well-lit and busy street, she was wearing a green rain jacket, navy blue pants, and white sneakers, her blonde hair tied back in a bun. 
It was a route she had taken many times before, a journey that should have been uneventful. However, as the night wore on, Sarah failed to return home, prompting concern from her friends and family. Her boyfriend reported her missing the next day, and an extensive search effort began. The disappearance of Sarah Everard sent shockwaves through London, a city known for its relative safety. The news spread rapidly, with social media platforms buzzing with the hashtag Find Sarah Everard. The community rallied, combing through the streets, distributing flyers and sharing information in a desperate bid to find her. Despite the tireless efforts of the police and the public, Sarah remained missing, her whereabouts shrouded in mystery. As the days turned into weeks, hope began to fade and the case took a sinister turn. On the evening of the 3rd of March, 2021, Sarah Everard was walking home from a friend's house in Clapham, South London. She had spoken to her boyfriend on the phone, making plans to meet the next day. Little did she know, this would be the last time they would speak. Around 9 p.m., Sarah was captured on doorbell camera footage on Pointers Road, just minutes before she encountered Wayne Cousins, a serving Metropolitan Police officer. Cousins, who had booked a white Vauxhall car from a vehicle hire company in Dover, had completed a 12-hour shift at the U.S. Embassy in London before traveling to Kent to collect the hire car. He then drove back to London, where he was recorded in Earl's Court and on Battersea Bridge, before arriving in Clapham. At approximately 9.34 p.m., Cousins, who had parked the Vauxhall on the pavement outside Pointer's Court, stopped Sarah and showed her his police warrant card before handcuffing her. He then drove her to Kent using the route of the car, which was later tracked using CCTV and ANPR cameras. By 11.43 p.m., Cousins and Sarah were in Dover, where they transferred to Cousins' personal seat car. Between 11.53 p.m. and 12.57 a.m. on the 4th of March, Cousins' mobile phone connected to cell sites in the Shepherdswell area, indicating that this is when he raped Sarah. At 2.34 a.m., Cousins purchased drinks from a Dover petrol station, believed to be after he had strangled Sarah using his police duty belt. Cousins then drove to Hodes Wood near Ashford, where he owned a plot of land. At 3.22 a.m., Cousins' car was captured on CCTV in the area before driving back to Dover to switch back into his rental car before returning it at 8.26 a.m. After returning the hire car, he drove his personal car to Sandwich, Kent, disposing of Sarah's mobile phone in one of the town's watercourses at 9.21 a.m. Later that day, Sarah's boyfriend contacted the police after she did not meet him, sparking a massive search operation. In the days following Sarah's disappearance, Cousins told senior colleagues that he was suffering from stress and no longer wanted to carry a gun. On the 5th of March, he bought and filled a petrol container at a service station in Whitfield before returning to Hodes Wood, where he burned Sarah's body inside a refrigerator. He then bought two large builder's bags from B&Q before returning to Hodes Wood on the 7th of March, where he used one of the bags to dispose of Sarah's remains in a pond. On the 10th of March, police searching Hodes Wood found human remains in a large builder's bag, approximately 100 meters from Cousins' plot. The case took a chilling turn when Wayne Cousins, a serving Metropolitan Police officer, was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murdering Sarah. This revelation sent shockwaves through the public and cast a grim shadow over the entire investigation. Police launched a meticulous search operation across various locations, including the woodlands near Ashford in Kent, where forensic officers meticulously combed through the terrain, desperately searching for any clue that could lead them to Sarah. The scale of the operation was immense, with authorities already having searched 750 homes in London before the focus shifted to specific addresses in Kent. As the investigation progressed, detectives made a harrowing discovery. Human remains were found in the woodland area, indicating a tragic end to Sarah's story. The news sent shockwaves through the community and added a somber tone to the ongoing investigation. Hi, Sarah. I don't know. Sarah went missing. Sarah went missing on Wednesday. Do you have anything about what happened? I know that um, she went missing up in um, London somewhere. Um, what a week or so, just from what I've got on the news. 
Have you ever personally met her? No, not personally. Have you had any interactions with her? No, always, what, what, what have I had personal interactions with her? Sat in handcuffs and you know, what I know her. I said, you must have something to say that I, I know her. Now, we believe it. you know something about where she is, and that's why we're here to look for her and to try and find her. And that's why we're talking to you now and to try and get you to have a good think about it. Because so, anything you can about what Okay, um, well, I am in financial, um, and I've been um, lent on by, um, I don't know who they are, the uh, group, the gang, whatever, um, and they told me why I need to go and pick up girls and pick them for them. So, um, I said, it's happening. Um, and it then came through that they're going to harm my family, take them away, you know, use them instead. Um, but at that point, I had no option to try and find somebody. Tell me about it. I need to find them. Tell me everything you know. That okay. I think that you'll have there was a white sprinter fan. Um, they, um, are in between sort of lemon and stone area that I've got to off. Um, I still don't know. I, I, I don't know. They, they just, I, I just um, park my car up and then the van come up behind me, flashed me, and they all jumped out. Um, and then they, they, they took this girl. So I just got out, um, opened my door, opened that door. Um, pushed me out against the front of the car, took the girl, drove off, that's it. They said we'll be in touch. So I'm here, I'm off work with stress because I'm here to protect my family. I want to be here 24 7 for my family. They come from my family. I've got nothing myself. Wayne Cousins was subsequently charged with Sarah's murder, a crime that shook the nation to its core. The revelation that a police officer, someone entrusted with upholding the law, could be implicated in such a heinous crime sent shockwaves through the public and raised serious questions about the integrity of the police force. The investigation uncovered shocking details about Cousin's actions, painting a chilling picture of his behavior leading up to the arrest. Despite Cousin's attempts to evade justice, the investigation continued relentlessly, uncovering more evidence and piecing together the events that led to Sarah's tragic fate. The case highlighted the dedication and perseverance of law enforcement agencies in the face of adversity, as they worked tirelessly to bring justice to Sarah and her family. As the investigation unfolded, new developments continued to emerge, keeping the public on edge and raising more questions than answers. The search for justice for Sarah Everard was far from over, with each new revelation adding a layer of complexity to an already intricate case. The nation waited with bated breath as the authorities worked tirelessly to uncover the truth and bring those responsible to justice. The arrest of Wayne Cousins, a serving Metropolitan Police officer, sent shockwaves through the community and raised serious questions about the integrity of the police force. Cousins' arrest was a pivotal moment in the investigation into Sarah Everard's disappearance, as it revealed a disturbing twist in the case. On the day of his arrest, Cousins was taken into custody by detectives investigating Sarah's disappearance. The news that a police officer was being held on suspicion of kidnapping and murdering Sarah sent shockwaves through the community and cast a shadow over the entire investigation. People were horrified to learn that someone sworn to protect them could be implicated in such a heinous crime. As details of Cousins' arrest emerged, it became clear that the investigation had taken a chilling turn. Cousins, a married father of two, was a serving police officer with the Diplomatic Protection Unit, tasked with guarding diplomatic premises in London, including Downing Street and foreign embassies. His arrest stunned colleagues and friends, who described him as a normal and quiet individual, raising concerns about how well we really know those around us. Following his arrest, Cousins was taken into custody for questioning, 
and forensic teams conducted searches at his home and other locations linked to him. The scale of the investigation widened, with authorities leaving no stone unturned in their quest for answers. In a shocking development, Cousins pleaded guilty to kidnapping, raping, and murdering Sarah Everard. Worth saying, um, of course, I fully understand the strength of feeling, I think, uh, as a woman and hearing from people about their experiences in the past and what they feel about uh, what happened to Sarah and what has been going on. I understand why so many people wanted to come and pay their respects and uh, kind of make a statement about this. Indeed, if it had been lawful, I'd have been there. I'd have been at a vigil. Six hours of yesterday was really calm and peaceful. Very few police officers around, respectful, people laying flowers, uh, not gathering, uh, and you know, a, a, a vigil that did not breach the regulations. Uh, unfortunately, later on, uh, we had a really big crowd that gathered, lots of speeches, uh, and Quite rightly, as far as I can see, my team felt this is now an unlawful gathering uh, which poses a considerable risk to people's health, according to the regulations. Uh, a really invidious position for my officers to find themselves in, um, but they then moved to try to explain to people, to engage with people, to get people to disperse from this unlawful gathering, and many, many, many people did. Unfortunately, a small one. His guilty plea sent shockwaves through the courtroom, as well as the nation, as the full extent of his crimes was laid bare. The court heard how Cousins abducted Sarah as she walked home from a friend's house in South London, using his police-issued vehicle to commit the crime. The impact of Cousins' guilty plea reverberated far beyond the courtroom, sending a wave of grief and anger through the public. Sarah's family was devastated by the news struggling to come to terms with the loss of their beloved daughter and sister. The guilty plea brought some closure to the family, knowing that Cousins had admitted to his crimes, but it also reopened old wounds, forcing them to relive the pain of Sarah's death. The public reaction to Cousins' guilty plea was one of outrage and disbelief. Many questioned how someone entrusted with upholding the law could commit such a horrific crime. The case reignited a national debate about women's safety and the need for systemic change to prevent similar tragedies in the future. The sentencing hearing for Wayne Cousins commenced on the 29th of September 2021 at the Old Bailey, presided over by Lord Justice Fulford. Following medical and psychiatric reports, Cousins's barrister Jim Sturman QC requested a life sentence with a determinate tariff suggesting that Cousins could become eligible for release on license in his 80s. However, on the 30th of September, 2021, Lord Justice Fulford sentenced Cousins to life imprisonment with a whole life order. We are today handing down our written judgment in cases concerning the sentences of four offenders convicted of murder and one of manslaughter. The second concerns Wayne Cousins, who pleaded guilty to kidnap and rape of Sarah Everard and later he pleaded guilty to her murder. On the 30th of September, 2021, he was sentenced to imprisonment for life for the murder with a whole life order. No separate penalty was imposed for the offenses of kidnapping and rape. Cousins seeks leave to appeal against sentence. In his case, we grant leave to appeal against sentence but dismiss the appeal. Although the circumstances of his case do not fall within the terms of the statutory provision, which provides that a whole life order should be the normal starting point, the individual facts are such that the judge was entitled exceptionally to impose a whole life order. That concludes this short hearing. Court rise. Fulford emphasized that Cousins' abuse of his position as a police officer to detain Sarah Everard was a crucial factor that significantly elevated the severity of the case. Despite the sentencing, 
Cousin sought leave to appeal against his sentence, a request that was reported in October 2021. However, in July 2022, the Court of Appeal rejected Cousins' appeal against his whole life sentence, affirming the severity of his punishment. As of December 2021, Wayne Cousins was serving his sentence at HM Prison Franklin in County Durham. His time in prison was further marred by additional charges. In March 2022, Cousins faced four counts of indecent exposure related to alleged incidents in January and February 2021. Subsequently, in February 2023, Cousins pleaded guilty to three incidents of indecent exposure that occurred in Kent in 2020 and 2021, with three additional counts ordered to lie on file. In a disturbing revelation, in November 2022, two of Cousins' colleagues, PC Jonathan Cobbin and former PC Joel Borders, were imprisoned for multiple counts of sending grossly offensive messages on a public communications network. The two officers were part of a WhatsApp group chat with Cousins and another officer, where they exchanged racist, homophobic, misogynistic, and ableist messages. In April 2023, it was reported that despite his heinous crimes, Cousins could be entitled to a police pension worth £7,000 a year. This revelation drew criticism, especially considering that Mayor of London Sadiq Khan had successfully applied to have Cousins stripped of his Metropolitan Police pension. However, it was noted that Cousins may be entitled to pensions from his pre-met service, highlighting a glaring gap in the system. The tragic case of Sarah Everard's abduction, rape and murder shocked the world and raised serious questions about women's safety and police accountability. Wayne Cousins, a serving police officer, abused his position of trust, leading to devastating consequences. The investigation, arrest and sentencing of Cousins revealed glaring gaps in the system that must be addressed. Despite being convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment, Cousins's case highlights the need for stricter vetting processes and more rigorous monitoring of police officers' behavior. The fact that Cousins was able to commit such heinous crimes while serving as a police officer raises concerns about the effectiveness of background checks and mental health assessments in law enforcement recruitment. Furthermore, the revelation that Cousins could be entitled to a police pension despite his crimes raises ethical questions about the treatment of convicted officers. Should individuals convicted of such serious crimes retain any benefits from their former profession? This issue calls for a re-evaluation of the policies surrounding pension entitlements for convicted officers. Sarah Everard's case serves as a somber reminder of the need for societal change and systemic reforms to ensure the safety and protection of women. It is a call to action for authorities to prioritize the safety of all citizens and to hold accountable those who abuse their power. As we reflect on this tragic event, we must work towards a future where such atrocities are prevented and justice is served for victims and their families. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any future uploads. See you in the next video.